Um, but we're glad that you're here this morning. And this is our second week in our series of Ask Belmar. And uh, I said last week, and, and I feel it this week, it sounded like a good idea at the time. Um, but uh, there's a, and really it is. Let me just uh, say, I'm really excited and nervous about both today's message and this series. Because it does give us an opportunity to really look into God's word at things that have real impact in our life. And we try to do that every week, but to be honest, like today's message is not a subject that I would normally choose to preach on. But that doesn't mean it's not important, and it doesn't mean that God's word doesn't address it. So our question today, and I actually put two questions or phrase the question two ways. I put, does God favor men over women? Now the question that was asked was actually this. Why does God favor men over women? That, that is the way that the person who asked the question phrased the question. Um, and we do want to look at the why of what God said, uh, but I want us to kind of examine this, this role of, of men and women in the church, in family, and, and in life in general. And what does the Bible say about that? I want to begin this morning by looking at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. And this probably will not be the last time I reference this passage of Scripture in this series. But the New Living Translation puts it this way. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and it teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. See, we are bombarded with information all of the time. We read things, we hear things, and I don't know how you are, but I tend to uh, be skeptical, and really I try to read things and listen to things with a skeptical ear and eye, if you will. I was telling uh, somebody this morning, I was listening uh, to the radio this morning, it was an ABC News blurb, and uh, this is, this is how, exactly how the person said it. It may not be an exact quote, but it's pretty close. They said, uh, Clinton and Trump are in a statistical dead heat nationally. That uh, this changed, uh, Clinton had been up by eight points and now it's two points and in their poll that's not really enough to matter and, and so it's a statistical dead heat. And then the person said, this despite that Trump is considered by many unqualified, um, uninformed about world events. They named like five of his shortcomings and then said he seems to be making ground because of Hillary's perceived shortcomings. And I thought that seems a little biased. Whether you're for Trump or Hillary, they only really chalked off the list of like five shortcomings of Trump. Now, to be fair, there are probably 50 more. And you could say an equally long list, I believe, of shortcomings of the other candidate. That's not, I don't want to make a political statement this morning. But what I, what I want to try to illustrate is everything we hear, we should look at critically. Because you can turn on one network and and look at one particular host and they will have a, a certain bias and political agenda. You can turn on a different network and a different host and get the polar opposite of that if you want. But when we look at God's word, it's different. Because it's not that we ought to look and judge what God has to say. It's that God through his word judges us. And so as we look at, at scripture, we 
if we're not careful, we can be critical of Scripture. Well, why does it say that? Well, why is this? When really as followers of Jesus Christ, as, as men and women who, who would seek to make God's word our guide for life, we should let Scripture judge us. And so this morning as we, as we delve into this subject, we want to let Scripture be our guide. Not the opinions of the pastor, not even your opinion or what somebody else says, but what does God say? And so we want to look at this idea of the role of men and women. And the first place I want to sort of examine that is the order in the church. Because, well, we're in church this morning, so I think it's a good place to start. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the book of Corinthians is a letter to the church at Corinth. And the church at Corinth, uh, Corinth was a very uh, strategic town. It was an economic hub. It was a place of, of uh, a center of pagan worship. And it was really sort of a, a leading society. It was, a, it was a, a, a place to be and to live. And Paul's writing to the church and the church struggled with how to follow Jesus in the culture in which they lived. And the indication from 1st and 2nd Corinthians is the church made a lot of mistakes. Later in 1st Corinthians 11, Paul's going to line out the, the receiving of the Lord's Supper. And he's like, man, you guys... You guys have divisions among you and you do this and you do that. And, and there's these things that Paul said, I need to set in order. And in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 3, he, he talks about the, the subject we're looking at this morning. He says, but I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is man and the head of Christ is God. And then he goes on and he talks about head coverings and women should wear head coverings and men shouldn't and and then he if we skip down to verse 8 it says for man is not from woman but woman for man nor was man created for the woman but woman for the man for this reason the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels nevertheless neither is man independent of woman nor woman independent of man in the lord for as woman came from man, even so man also comes through woman, but all things are from God. Now this passage in 1 Corinthians 11 is interesting because it deals with some very specific local cultural issues. It talks about women and what they wear when they go to church and the, their hair. And you might say, well, why would it address that? Well, because in Corinth, there were women who wore their hair very, very short. And they, that was a part of who and what they were. But they were prostitutes at a pagan temple. And so Paul, in addressing the church, said, listen, you need to... He, he says to women, you should wear your hair long. You shouldn't identify with these types of women. And traditionally at that time, women would, would wear a, a, a covering, a shawl, some sort of a head covering. But these temple prostitutes did not do that. And so he talks about how they ought to be when it relates to head coverings. But he also deals with some things that are outside of that local culture. He deals with the role of men and women. And he says that there is an order in the church. That God has established an order that we should follow. Now it's important to understand that rank and equality or quality are not the same thing. Notice 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 3. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. Now, that makes sense, right? We're 
followers of Jesus Christ. We are Christians. So that makes sense that Christ is our leader. Then he says, the head of woman is man. And that's what we're talking about today. But then he says, the head of Christ is what? Is God. Now, that's interesting because Jesus Christ is God. Matter of fact, Philippians tells us that he, he, it was not robbery for him to be equal with God. He's equal with God. And yet, Jesus Christ is subservient to the Father. Is he less than the Father? No, he's not. He doesn't have less power. He doesn't have less authority. But it says the head of Christ is God. Now, I want to make an analogy this morning, and I, I understand, as I thought through this this week, I thought, you know, I don't want to make anybody mad. And then as I read scripture, I thought, eh, somebody might be mad. <laughs> and so I'm going to make an analogy this morning, and if you want to be mad about the analogy, you probably can. I'm not saying it's a perfect analogy, but I think it is applicable. And the analogy is this. All of us probably began life as children. Now, I don't know all of you in your background, but I think I can safely say that most of you began life as a child. And if you grew up, you probably had some contact with your parents or parental figures or at least one of your parents. And so your first role in a family is typically that of a child. As you grow, you might have other roles. Now I have a wife and I have three children and so I have the role of husband and father. But my mom's here this morning. She comes here to Belmar and to her, I'm not husband or father. I'm still son. And although our relationship over the years has changed, uh, some might say not a whole lot, but there's still a level that I am always going to be her son. She's always going to be my mom. Now, when I was younger, I, I, you know, at first I knew I couldn't take my dad, but I thought I could probably overpower my mom. And then, you know, she whipped me, and so I realized I couldn't. But now, it, that, it's not based on physical strength. Our relationship's not, it's not necessarily based on, on intellectual ability, but it's just based on our roles and our respect. I love my mom. I appreciate all that she's done for me. And I want to respect her. And the truth is, now we're kind of, our relationship is evolving. She's getting older. And sometimes she asks me to do things that just seem like a pain. I'll just be honest. Not very often, but occasionally. You know what? I want to try to do them and, and have a good attitude about them. Why? Because my kids are watching and I'm getting old too. No, not just because of that. But because I love her. And I always want to be her son. I, I want her to be proud of me. I want her to be pleased with me. I want her, I, I just, I, I'm her son. She's my mom. We understand that. They say, are you equating women to children? Well, that's where you could be mad. And I'm, and I'm not saying that, but what I am saying is we all have roles to play. We all have roles in which we, we find ourselves. And here the Bible says that in the church there is an order. And the order is God Almighty. And it's Jesus Christ. And it's men and it's women. And you, you can look at that and you can say, I don't think that's fair. I don't think that's, that's right. But can I tell you, that's not, 
that's not what I invented. That's what scripture tells us. Maybe Jesus could have said, hey, I don't think it's right that I've got to be subservient to the Father. I've got all power. I'm eternal. I'm all-knowing. But thank God that Jesus Christ was subservient to the Father because someone had to sacrifice. We, if we had to pay the price for our sin, we would do so for eternity in, in damnation. But God, Jesus, paid the price for us. So rank does not necessarily equate to value. Philippians chapter two and verse nine says this, therefore God also has highly exalted him, talking about Jesus, and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now listen, Jesus Christ is to be praised and to be, to be glorified. But he is under the Father. He's submissive to the Father. And so in church there is an order. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul writing to his protege in the ministry, Timothy, he says this in verse 8. I desire therefore that the, that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In like manner also, that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Now, I just want to tell you, that is my least favorite verse on this whole subject. And yet, as I studied and as I prayed this week, I said to myself, I can't in honesty take on this subject and not, not read that verse. Because I don't want to be dishonest about what God's word says. And I read that and, and I just had a sort of meditation time with God. I said, you know, most of these other verses I could kind of soften a little bit, but that one's kind of harsh. And why'd you have to put that in there, God? I was telling you how I thought. And you know what? God didn't really give me an answer except for 1 Timothy 3.16, which is, listen, my word is gonna, gonna tell you how you need to live your life. And I went, oh, okay. Maybe I just need to submit to what your word says. Now, I, I wanna be clear this morning. At Belmar, women are not to be second-class citizens. Uh, and we're going to talk about this, but our value doesn't come. We're, we're going to talk in a second about the role of pastor and the role of deacon. Listen, my value ultimately doesn't come because I'm a pastor. I mean, who cares? I mean, I care, but that's not what makes me valuable. Ultimately, when you boil it down, my real worth comes from the fact that God loves me. That God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for me and to be my sacrifice and my savior. And you know what? He did that for every man and woman in the world. And so our value isn't in some position. But we do want to try and be a church that follows God's word. And so we do want to look at a couple of, of offices this morning. The first is the office of pastor or bishop. And we're just going to read out of 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1. It says, this is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless. The husband of one wife, temperate sober-minded of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, 
One who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Now you might hear that this morning and think, gee preacher, I see some shortcomings. Me too. Me too. I'm not saying that I fulfill this, these qualifications perfectly. But I reference this, we're not talking about that this morning. Nobody asked that question, so I don't have to answer it today. But we're talking this morning about the idea that really one of the qualifications of a pastor is that he's the husband of one wife. The idea that he's a man. And this, Paul goes on in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and talks about the office of deacon in verse 8. He says, likewise deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. But let these also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons being found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderous, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children in their own house as well. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And so again, here, it says he's the husband of one wife, and then it lays out uh, some qualifications or characteristics of the wife of a deacon as well. And so when someone asks, well, how come we don't have a female pastor at our church? Well, this is why biblically. And why are our deacons males? Well, this is why biblically. Now, let me tell you, in our deacons meeting, we talked about this last month. We are looking at how do we take both men and women and effectively use the gifts and the abilities that God has given them? How do we allow those who have uh, care, skills and abilities and some of them in, in even leadership positions for that to be used? And how can we do that well and, and, and follow the principles of Scripture? And we're wrestling with that because we don't want to say, well, it's only the men that do this, that, and the other. And if you're a woman, you just can't serve. That's, I don't believe that's biblical. And I don't believe that's how God would have us to be as a church. But we do want to follow the order that God has set up. And so God has created an order within the church. And he's created an order in the home. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22, it says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And so, and we've talked about this before. I don't want to spend a ton of time in here, but the, the wife, again, the husband is to be the head of the home and the wife is to be submissive to him. The wife has a role to play, but the husband has a role to play too. In Ephesians 5 and verse 25, it says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. And in verse 33, he goes on and says, Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. And so there's to be this idea of love and respect within marriage. It's not a lording over of authority. Matter of fact, the husband is, is to sacrifice. His model is Christ. And I've said this before, the, the model or the example for the woman is the church. And we're to submit to authority, women, wives are to submit to the authority of their husbands like the church is supposed to submit to Christ. But the model for husbands is Jesus Christ himself. So guys, you can ask of your wife submission and for her to be like the church, just make sure you're just like Jesus. 
Now that's not an excuse for the wife not to do what the Bible says, but it's just to let the husbands know we have a high standard. And again, those roles do not equate to value. I was thinking about this today, and I've referenced this before, but most recently, uh, I, I think I gave it up about three years ago. I coached high school football for about four years, and I'd done it uh, years before that as well, but uh, the last three years, I was a varsity head coach. And I had a guy on my staff who for 30 years had been a, a head college coach. This guy forgot more about football than I will ever know. And Danny, what a great guy. He was in his 80s when he was coaching with me. He was out at practice every day. I'm going to be lucky to walk at 80. This guy's running around. And what a tremendous guy. Now, between the two of us, one guy knew more about football than the other. Not the head coach. He did. Now, ultimately, as the head coach, I had, the, I had certain responsibilities. I had to make certain decisions, and ultimately, those responsibilities fell to me. But if I didn't utilize his talents and abilities, I'd be a fool. Now, I don't want to be a fool. I'm married. Uh, my wife and I have been married for 24 years. Listen, God has blessed us with a, with a wonderful marriage. And that is really a combination of the character and patience of my wife and the blessings of Almighty God. I have very little to do with that. My wife has abilities and skills that are far beyond mine. Now I like to think I bring a few things to the marriage too, but it's primarily comic relief. My wife has basically handled the, the, the finances of our marriage since we've been married. She pays the bills, she writes the checks, she does all of those things. You know why? She's highly organized. She's great at it. We don't, we're, not, we're not late on our bills. Our electricity doesn't turn on and off. Uh, the, the, the cable's always on. Why? Because she takes care of those things. Guess who's unorganized? Now I could say, yo baby, I'm in charge of this, this deal. But if I did, we ought to stock up on candles. I'm just saying. And, and the beautiful thing is, I do see where God has brought us together that our skills and our abilities might combine to do, you know, we have three kids. I mean, if you're a parent here this morning, you know, I mean, I was talking to a, a young a young parent the other day and, and they were talking about how it was overwhelming just having one kid. I said, yeah, and you're playing two on one. Just wait till the numbers get equal. You, I mean, you're gonna be overwhelmed. But you know, my wife is, is loving and merciful. She's the one that our kids can come to when they just need compassion and they need some, some tenderness not typically that guy, but sometimes a little authority is necessary in the lives of our children. I usually get to be that guy. But, but our kids need both. They need mercy and they need tenderness. And I love my kids, but I don't show it as well as my wife does. But they need discipline and they need training. And my wife implements that, but she's not as good as I am. But one's not more valuable than the other. But God has established the roles that we're to take on. But I do believe between men and women, there's a quality in Jesus Christ. 
In Romans chapter 2, it's really talking about sin and the judging of sin and the sacrifice of Jesus. In Romans chapter 2 and verse 11, it says, for there is no partiality with God. Now, as I read that, I thought, is that true? Because you read some of these other scriptures that we're looking at and you're like, it kind of seems like partiality. But you know, the more I read, the more I came to realize that I'm not sure God values what we view as equality as much as we do. Here's what I mean. God is first and foremost concerned with our character. He's concerned with who we are and who and what we are becoming in him. We are concerned about equality. If you are a parent and you have more than one child and they can speak, then you've heard that's not fair. First you heard why, then you heard no, then you heard that's not fair. And most parents that I know, and certainly my particular parent, parenting technique, is to simply say, what a tremendous life lesson you now have. Life isn't fair. A couple of years ago, I was driving down to see my in-laws in Texas. We were driving down a highway. There were a group of four cars in a line. Oh, this is so, such injustice. I was the third car in line. <laughs> We were just rolling along, not hurting anybody, not exactly obeying the posted speed limit. One car got singled out, persecuted, <laughs> and issued a ticket. <laughs> the third car in line. And you know what I said? I said, that's because I got Colorado plates and that guy was picking on me. I don't know if it's true or not, but you know what? Sometimes life isn't fair. Those other three people, they didn't get tickets. I did, and I had to pay for it. Now, I've been around long enough to know there was probably a time or two when I deserved a ticket and didn't get one. And in general, those things kind of tend to balance out. But you know what? If we want to look and find areas where life isn't fair, we can always find them. Where someone else is treated different or better or what we perceive to be better. We can look around and say, why couldn't I have been taller, better looking, more talented, have the opportunities that this person has or that person has? But I don't know that God is as, as concerned about that as he is about who we are. And our development to be more like Christ. Very quickly, just a couple of things I wanted to point out. Women were very involved in the ministry of Jesus. There's many examples of that, but in Luke chapter eight and verse two, it says a certain woman who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others who provided for him from their substance. This passage tells us that it was these groups of women who supported financially the ministry of Jesus. We see women there at the, at the cross, at, at Christ's crucifixion. In Matthew chapter 28, it was women who G, the resurrected Christ first appeared to. And in Acts chapter 8 and verse 12, we see that salvation is offered to men and women alike. But when they believed Philip as he preached, the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. The Bible tells us that men and women equally have access to God in prayer. That Christ died equally for us. And so in that regard, God has not set up partiality between men and women. In the church and in our homes, God has established an order that he wants us to live in. But we need to understand what that is. And that does not mean that men should be superior to women. 
Rather, it means that this is the role that God has given to us. And I want to conclude with this passage this morning. Look with me at Colossians chapter 2, beginning in verse 18. This is really kind of a repeat of what's said in Ephesians, but he says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter towards them. Children, obey in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Bond servants or slaves, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of, in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And then he says, and whatever you do, whatever role you're in, do it heartily or with all of your heart as unto the Lord and not to men. Knowing that from the Lord, you will receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. And then listen to verse 25. But he who does wrong will re be repaid for what he has done. And there is what? No partiality. See, in verse 24 and 25, he deals with the idea of reward and judgment. And he says, God will judge you according to your heart. And in that, there's no partiality. And so, life may not be fair to you. Or you may not feel like there's a quality in the way that you would like it. And I'm not saying that as a society, we ought not to try to strive for equality. I'm not saying that this morning. But I'm saying that we understand that we're all different. Our circumstances and, and who we are is unique. But God who is righteous and holy, will judge each and every one of us according to our heart. Whether we're man or woman, whether we're father or child, regardless of who we are, God is going to judge us and God rewards us. And so I would encourage you to consider what God has said what his word says on this subject. And seek to have your heart to be submissive to his word. Let's pray this morning.